encounter where your people got back to the book. They got back to, the, to your word. And I pray that you would help us to see from what happened in that day that the same thing and the same attitudes God's people had could be practiced in our day in order to see you do a great work. And I just ask that you give us a hunger. Lord, I pray that whatever age, whatever position or place in life we all are collectively this evening, that God ultimately each of us would be unsatisfied to continue our lives without seeing you do a great work. And I pray that you challenge us to this this evening, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I love what the Bible says here. If you were to read Ezra, you'd see extra commentary. You'd see it from Ezra, the scribe, from his perspective. But the Bible says that the people, in verse 1, they gathered themselves together as one man. Uh, this work that the people have been uh, doing has created a real unity in Jerusalem. The result of all the effort that has happened from the building of the walls, the determination that they're going to do something, even if they don't know how to do it, they're going to strengthen their hands to do the work, so they're going to learn how to do the work, and that they are willing to do it, and then the opposition that they have overcome, each of these things has ultimately made it so that we have a people who we see are gathered together as one man. Now the description of the people in Jerusalem before Nehemiah's coming was that they were scattered. The description was that the walls were broken down and that basically people were just being continually plundered. If you lived in Jerusalem and you planted a garden, the inhabitants around outside the city waited until it was time for the harvest and they came and harvested your garden. That's a little discouraging, isn't it? It's sort of like having iguanas in your backyard. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you what, I have not tried to plant anything edible in my backyard for several years, and it's because of these crazy iguanas. I mean, it doesn't seem, it seems like it doesn't matter what you do. I know there would be things to the extreme that you could do. But you get a garden and get it planted. I had some beautiful green beans and tomatoes a couple of years ago, and I mean, they were looking fantastic. And the iguanas came and ate the plants down to nothing, ate the leaves, ate the stems, ate everything, just down to absolutely nothing. Uh, Eddie, Eddie gave me, I think about a year and a half ago, a limequat tree. I got a little limequat tree. And you'd think like citrus leaves maybe wouldn't be all that terribly tasty. But I planted that in my backyard. It came out one time and it was just stripped. I mean, every leaf on it and a lot of the, any of the green branches on it were eaten down to nothing. It's, it's actually making it this year, but that's because the iguanas have been weakened. I've weakened their, uh, well, there's a new, new bunch of them that's moved in, but I removed a lot of them. And so, anyway, the, uh, they, they're back. Well, I can, it's for me, you ask, Pastor, would you like to have a good garden in your backyard? I actually kind of would. And I might actually do it, except that I just hate to plant things for lizards to eat. <laughs> it's a little discouraging. And uh, I can imagine what it must have felt like. It's certainly not the same thing at all. But can you imagine what it must have felt like to be an inhabitant at Jerusalem? have a lot of your brethren scattered around the world from the captivity. You're the lone few that are left at Jerusalem. And you look around and you see that the walls are broken down and in disrepair. The gates have been burnt out. And you realize that anything you do to try to make things better kind of by yourself is going to be done so that someone else can come and just take it. There are literally people that are just predators in the world. There always have been, aren't there? I mean, literally, they just wait for something. Uh, I, I think about thieves and the attitude of thieves. Thieves literally watch for people to earn things, purchase things, get them, and then they come and just take them from them. That's a little discouraging. We just today returned the 5x8 trailer, that, or the 6x10, whatever it was, trailer that we used to, uh, for our luggage going to Bill Rice Ranch. It's an enclosed trailer. I used to have a couple of enclosed trailers. And uh, it was always nice because when we go to the ranch, we just use my trailers. I had to borrow one this year uh, from someone. I emptied it out, and Charlie and myself and Anthony uh, just put everything back in it today. But the reason I had to do all that is because I didn't have a trailer. Why well, didn't I have a trailer? Well, because some people just took my trailers. <laughs> uh, they came and just stole them. And uh, I, I looked at buying a trailer again this year, and I thought, you know, I don't want to go through that again. I don't want to have something 
that I've got to guard so carefully uh, because people will just come and steal it. It's a little discouraging when people just take things uh, from you. And I can understand, I can sympathize with the people in Jerusalem and they're kind of feeling as though it wasn't worth their while to rebuild the city or to try to do anything. It felt as though, well, you know what, it doesn't matter what I do, I, can't, I couldn't build the walls myself. And they felt as though, well, no matter if, if I did try to do something, then it would be taken from me. But yet one person, one man, who recognized that it doesn't really matter all of the reasons not to do it, it ought to be done. Because it's the testimony of the Lord. It's the testimony of God. What kind of a God would allow His people to be living in this kind of a state of affairs? It was a matter of testimony. And so Nehemiah's attitude was, I'm going to rebuild the walls of the city. And he went, he got permission from the king. He got, uh, he got permission to use timber. He got uh, permission for materials. And he was going to rebuild the walls. And then the people, the Bible says, strengthen their hands to do the work. Now we've come to the place that even though they had, re had had opposition, that the walls had been rebuilt. And now the people say, uh, or now they are, the Bible says, all with one. All gathered, the Bible says, as one man. And here, just the statement that they were gathered together as one man gives off a completely different impression, does it not? When Nehemiah first went to Jerusalem, they're scattered. Now they are one man. This is a group of folks that you'd think twice about messing with, isn't it? No one's going to come in and plunder them when they're gathered together as one man. There's a unity there. There is a oneness in cause and in spirit. There is a can-do attitude. And we see that the result of it is that they gathered themselves in the street that was before the water gate, and the Bible says they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Ezra did not say, hey guys, it's time we got back into the Word of God. And the people responded. We see that the people have had a change in their heart's attitude, and they've come to Ezra and said, Ezra, bring the law. We need law in this place. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this this evening, but you do understand that the law of Moses is more than just a Bible. It literally is Israel's law. You understand that, don't you? A lot of people get confused about things that are in the law. Uh, you know, I had I was reading something somebody emailed or was arguing about why God's not good because it had they they summarized it this way. He said, "Yeah, God's law tells how to beat your servant. You know, gives you the prescription for how to beat your servant. Or God's law, uh, God's law says this is how you get divorced. Or God's law, this and that. No, actually, it was it was the law for the people." Jesus explained, didn't he, when they came and asked him about divorce? Jesus explained that the reason that those things were included in the law was because of the hardness of the hearts of the people. And so this is the law of the land. So what we see here is that the people have rebuilt the walls. They've begun to rebuild the gates, so the gates have been rebuilt. And now they're saying, we need to get some law around here. We need to get some law around here. In other words, we want to have a lawful city. We want to be a people, again, who are united and who are under the law. And so, I'm not taking away, by the way, with the statement I just made, I'm not taking away from the truth uh, that, this, that God's law is God's word. I wouldn't say that at all. But with this desire for lawfulness comes a submission to God's word. And so, now here we are. I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong page here. My notes. Um, here we see that the people are getting back to God's word. Verse 2, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding, upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street, that was before the water gate, from the morning until midday, before the men and women, and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people... Now, in, in your Bible, you'll see that those two words are were attentive. And literally, that's the idea of the ears of all the people. The original language uh, would have carried a thought in it 
of that, that would take more than one word to translate. I love that our translation of the Scripture is so accurate that it lets you know it took more than one word to describe this. And when it would say the ears were toward something, it means they were paying attention to, or their ears were attentive. In other words, everybody is listening. You ever have a hard time hearing something? Have you ever uh, had somebody say, oh, they're about to give announcements, or about to say something, and you think, oh, I don't want to miss this? What do you do? And literally, the attitude of all the people... Can you imagine speaking to people that are like this? That are listening carefully? Their ears, the Bible says, are toward or they're attentive to hear what God had to say. Now friend, I just want to remind us that paths do lead to a place that prepares something in your heart. And literally the things that the people have been doing have laid the groundwork in their hearts for them to be attentive to the Word of God. It's important, isn't it, that even when you don't feel like doing right, that you put yourself in the right place? You ever realize I'm cold? You ever had it in your life and just said, you know what, I'm just cold spiritually. I'm just cold. You know, I know Christians are like, I'm cold. And it's almost like, God, I dare you to do something to warm me up. God sometimes is gracious enough to do that. But you know what our attitude ought to be when we're cold? Well, I need to get out of this cold place. Your heart's cold. It's because you're away from the things that make you warm. I've had people say, well, you know, I, hear, I go to church, I hear preaching, it just doesn't affect me. It just doesn't move me. Well, that could be a commentary on the preaching, or that could be a commentary on your heart. I don't know. I can't say which. But I will say this. I have seldom ever been in a place with a heart that wanted to hear and wanted to receive truth. I can't recall ever being in a place where God's Word was preached and it didn't have an effect in my heart. So if you're cold, what do you do? Well, you say, I need to get somewhere where it's warm. <laughs> I need to get to a place where things are conducive to me being responsive to the truth of the Scripture. And that's literally what's happened. The people have said, we're going to strengthen our hands to do the work. They've built the walls. And now all of a sudden they're they're excited. I mean, can you can you sense as you read the text at this point, can you sense that the people are just really anticipating what God's going to do and that they're excited, they're thrilled about what's going to happen? Friend, I am not for at all a artificial enthusiasm. I don't it bothers me when services where there's going to be preaching of the word of God have to almost start with something to amp the people up or psych people up or get people ready for something. I, I'm, I'm for the worship preparing the hearts for the preaching of the Word of God. But friend, it's troublesome to me when there is an enthusiasm generated just because you just want to in generate enthusiasm. That isn't what has happened here. What's happened here is people have begun making steps that have helped them to see that things they didn't think God could do, God could actually do. They've seen God work, and now they're excited about God working, and they're saying, let's get God's law. Let's find out more about God. Let's find more out about what God can do. And it's actually amazing uh, when you read this, this account. In verse 4, the Bible says, And as when the scribes stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood Mattathiah, and Shema, and Aniah, and Urijah, and Hilkiah, and Messiah, and his right hand, and his left hand, Padiah, and Mishael, Malchiah, and Hashem, and Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And here we see the blessing. I want to look at this. This is a model for getting back to the Word of God. In verse 6, the Bible says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And the people answered, Amen, Amen. And with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So literally, Ezra stands up and he blessed the Lord. Can you imagine the blessing here in this at this moment? I can imagine just standing there before the people with Ezra and those that were standing on this pulpit that's been built up. Now, it's not a pulpit like we're thinking of. It's a platform. A pulpit's a platform that he's standing on. And he's standing on this platform, and while he's standing there, he's up above the people. And seeing all the people gathered there 
as one man. I mean, literally everybody in the city is gathered there as one person, with one intent. And I can imagine being Ezra and just looking out and seeing, here are people that want to hear from God. And Ezra got up and I imagine he said something like, God, what you've done is wonderful. The way that you've allowed the walls of this city to be built, the way that you've protected us while we put the gates in, the hope and anticipation we have that actually this season we're going to have our own harvest. But more than that, God, what's wonderful is what you've done in us. The way you've stirred these people. The way that you've brought us together in unity. And God, I just have to say, you are beyond amazing. God, you are beyond any description that I could give of you. God, we are in awe of you right now. And the people said, that's what I wanted to say. Amen. Amen. And then the Bible says they bowed down before God. They literally bowed themselves down. And here we find that is, this is one of the places in the Scripture if you want to understand worship. This is worship. Worship is not ex acting out myself or a lifting up myself. So the Bible says they lifted up their heads. They said, Amen, Amen. And then they bowed down and they worshiped. Bowed down to the ground. Literally, when, they, when Ezra had given the blessing and he had literally talked about who God is and who God, what God had done, the people said, Oh, what a God. And whenever you really see God in the sense of, Oh, what a God He is. You're always reminded of, Oh, what a man I am. And it always draws a healthy contrast and creates a sense of worship. My friend, you don't worship when you come in and think, you know what, I'm going to show people how to go before God. You don't create a sense of worship when you come in and you think, you know something, I'm going to really sing today or I'm going to really whatever. No, you create a sense of worship when you come in and you realize, I don't deserve to even know God. And I'm amazed that I've seen God's hand in my life and that God's Spirit lives in me. And when you really begin to look at God, it literally will thrill your soul, but it will also cause you to be humble before God. Worship always requires a great sense of humility. Worship bows down. It does not exalt itself. And so here we see that the blessing is offered in verse 6. The Bible says they bowed their heads, they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And I think of this and look at this, this statement about worship and you recognize that worship isn't one of these things that's us. Worship is literally alone. And it may be everyone in a place. But if you bowed your faces to the ground, you wouldn't be looking at everybody else, would you? Do you see this? Literally, it's an, almost a hiding of the faces. Bowing their heads to the ground so that they only see themselves and God. The second thing we see is the reading and the teaching of the Word of God. You see these men that stood up next to uh, Ezra and they're described in verse 7 and they, in the second part of verse 7 it says they caused the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. Verse 8, So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So now they've come to a place where the, where the Word, the law of God, isn't some symbolic book. It isn't God in a box. It isn't you know something nebulous. It literally is what did God say. It's the words and the sense or the understanding of the words. And here are people who are not just doing uh, time with God, if you will. In other words, they're not just saying, okay, I'm going to read my Bible. And a lot of Christians, I think, we, we're content just to read the Scripture, but we're not concerned with understanding the Scripture. And friend, any time you want to know God, you need to know what God says. And it isn't just a matter of plowing through and reading it. The Bible says that they were careful in how they read it. In other words, when it was read, then they gave the sense and they made the people understand it. 
So they understood what God said. So we saw first, we saw the blessing, then we saw the reading and the teaching of God's Word. Let's look at the response. Verse 9, And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Okay, so we see the response. The response was when they understood what God said, they said, uh-oh. And friend, it was more than just, well, what God says and what I am are two different things. We have a disagreement. No, it was, God says this is what I ought to be. And this is what I am, and it isn't what I ought to be. And it grieved them. Friend, any time we go to the Word of God and we see that we are not what we ought to be, our immediate response ought to be that we ought to be grieved about it. it. ought to grieve us. ought to break our hearts. Why should it break our hearts? Well, you know, I think that it could not be a better time to read about grieving the individuals than what we've been looking at the last couple of weeks on Sunday mornings when we've been looking at grieving God's Spirit. God's a person. And we're able to grieve God. And because, because of not being what they, they were supposed to be, they recognized that they grieved God Almighty. And they cared enough about it that it grieved them. God help us to come to the place where our concern is not that God has grieved us, but that we're concerned that we've grieved God. You don't love someone if you don't care about grieving them. Don't love someone if you don't care about grieving them. What's well, a cold relationship when a husband and wife don't care about grieving each other, isn't it? It's a cold relationship when friends are not concerned about grieving each other. You know, it's kind of uh, it is kind of culture today to say that it doesn't matter about anybody else. What matters is me. You ever heard things like you've "Got to take care of yourself." You gotta look out for you gotta, you know what? Nothing's okay if you're not okay. You ever heard somebody say that? If you're not okay, then nothing's okay. Well, I'm not gonna debate that there's some truth or some poor importance to a person being okay. But ultimately what that statement means is look out for yourself and don't worry about what'll happen to someone else. I Met mean, people, they break their word, they don't keep their word because they say, Well, I gotta take care of myself. I gotta look out for myself. Well, you know something? That shows a cavalier unconcern. It shows a disregard for what you'll do or what will happen to someone else. God give us believers that are concerned about grieving Him. God give us believers that are concerned about what will happen to other Christians if I grieve God and if I grieve them. Friend, if you're concerned about grieving someone else, it'll grieve you when you do. You ever hurt someone and realized it? Someone you cared about, you said something wrong, you did something, uh, maybe inadvertently even, but you realized that you hurt the person. How'd you respond? Too bad? <coughs> Tough life? We all have to go through some pain? Or did you respond by saying, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Did it break your heart that you hurt someone? And that's the attitude. Can you see the spirit of these people now? This is a tender-hearted group of individuals. And having recognized that, the response of the leadership was to say, okay, guys, you're grieved, you're weeping, time to stop. My friend, when you've come to the place of grief, you're ready to come to the place of joy. When you come to the place of grief, that is the precedent to coming to the place of joy. When the things that aren't right in your life grieve you, you are just one step away from being able to rejoice. Why is that? Because of the nature of God. Because of the nature of God. I love 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't it a wonderful thing that when you finally acknowledge that I've sinned before God and it grieves your heart that you look to God with that attitude and God says, I forgive I forgive. <laughs> You're cleansed. It's over. It's done. And friend, you ever stood up after being cleansed and realized, I'm forgiven? Amen. 
I am forgiven. <laughs> no more crying. Literally, it's a time for joy. And that's what we see in verses 9 through 11. The Bible says, For all the people wept, the end of verse 9, when they heard the words of the law. But then the Bible says, Nehemiah said unto them, verse 10, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Huh. You ever looked at that statement in context? The joy of the Lord is my strength. We sing the song, don't we? The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. A people without joy are a weak people. Is what Nehemiah is saying. Nehemiah said, we need to be a strong people. We need to be a people that are gathered together and are able to defend themselves and are able to give the kind of a testimony that we have a God who takes care of His people. Nehemiah said, aggrieved people aren't strong people, a joyful people are. Joyful people are. You can preach a message about the joy of the Lord as your strength, couldn't you? There's a doctrine there, there's a teaching there. A Christian without joy is a weak Christian. The Bible commands joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. A Christian without joy is a weak Christian. A Christian with joy is a strong Christian. Now, if you want a nugget, grab that one. That's a truth. A Christian without joy is a weak Christian. A believer who has no joy in his heart is a weak believer. But a believer who has joy in his heart, my friend, is a strong believer. Now, I'm not talking about an act. I'm talking about the real deal. What brings the real deal? Well, grief, forgiveness, and joy. That's the process we see here. The response was grief... They went from grief to joy. And we're going to finish this evening by seeing one last step in the process. Look at verse 13. On the second day, the Bible says, We're gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month, and that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in all Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth into the mountain, fetch olive branches, and pine branches, and myrtle branches, and palm branches, and branches of thick trees to make booths, as is written, verse 16, So the people went forth and brought them, made themselves booths. Go down to chapter 9 with me now, will you please? The Bible says, oh, wait, wait I'm sorry, verse 17 of chapter 8. I, I'm wrong about that. Verse 17, All the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths, and sat under the booths, for since the day of Joshua, the son of Nun, unto that day, had not the children of Israel done so, and there was very great gladness. Yeah, I scratch my head when I read this. Do you realize what the Scripture says here? They're reading the law, the sense of the law is being given, and they recognize that God had said, when you go into the promised land, once a year, I want you to have a feast, I want you to have a time that you set apart, and you rejoice over the land that God's given you. Rejoice over what God's done, and I want you to remember where you came from, so I want you to camp out. See, you stayed in tents in the wilderness all this time, and so we want you to just stay outside for a week while the law is read. And you remember that you said, we'll do it. Remember what the people had said when Moses gave the law? They said, okay, it's a good deal. We will take the deal. God, that's your law. We'll be governed by it and we'll accept your blessing for it. And the Bible says that from the time of Joshua until this time, that had never been done. They'd never kept the Feast of the Booths. It's tragic, isn't it? Does that give just a little bit of an insight as to why the people got away from the Lord? Why they didn't let the land rest? Why they didn't weren't concerned about the prophecies of destruction and captivity? Does it help you understand a little bit? How in the world could people be so naive when it comes to knowing the way that they're supposed to live? You ever read Judges when the Bible says every man did that which is right in his own eyes? 
Why did they do what was right in their own eyes? Because they never read God's Word. And literally from the days of Joshua until this day, the people have worshipped, if they worshipped at all, a God whom they only knew on the basis of conjecture or their own personal imagination. They had no clue what was in God's law. They had no clue how they were supposed to live. And they had not ever practiced a commanded feast. Now, now let me ask you a question. How important was the Feast of Booths? That's a question for you to think on just a minute. You can answer it. It's a question. It's not rhetorical. I'm asking a question. How important was the Feast of Booths? Unimportant, fairly important, or extremely important? Those are your choices. Extremely. Extremely. extremely important. Now, on the basic level, it was extremely important first because God said to do it. Anything God says to do is important, right? In other words, uh, God isn't just playing silly games. But God does... <coughs> God does honor obedience, doesn't He? God honors obedience. So on the basic level, it's important simply because God said to do it, and God honors obedience. But why might the keeping of the Feast of the Booths have been important? Give me some of the reasons. Help them to remember about them coming out of Egypt and how God took care of them. If you forget where you came from, it's hard to, it's hard to appreciate where you are. Okay, so that's a good point. What else? Other reasons? Why would it be extremely important to keep the Feast of Booths? God said to, if you forget where you came from, it's, it's uh, easy or it's hard to remember to appreciate where you are. What did we say a little bit ago about joy? It's your strength. Yeah, joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, is a feast a sad or a happy occasion? It's a happy occasion. They read the law. They said, oh, it's time for Feast of Booths. <laughs> We've been terrible. And Nehemiah said, it's not time to cry, it's time to rejoice. It's feast time. He said, go out and get yourselves meals. If people came when they weren't prepared, make them food. Let's, let's have a potluck. Let's eat. Let's eat the fat. Let's, let's have a good time. It's important because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so keeping a feast brings joy, doesn't it? You know, I'm, I... I I don't know what my favorite holiday is, but I love Thanksgiving. Amen. Don't you? I love Thanksgiving. I personally, and, and this is just a terrible uh, personality trait that I actually have, I personally uh, am one of these people that every, you know, the Bible says one man esteemeth one day another, above another, another esteemeth every day alike. I'm an every day alike personality. That's just the honest truth. I think every day is a good day, but it's an equal day. But we celebrate days, don't we? Uh, we celebrate uh, the resurrection, Easter. We celebrate uh, Christmas, uh, Christ's coming. Uh, we celebrate birthdays. My wife will tell you, I just am the worst birthday person in the world. I just, to me, I like celebrating other people's birthdays pretty well. I, I honestly, I'm no fun on my birthday. Um, if you want to have a get-together or something like that, I enjoy the get-together, but I, it doesn't matter if it's on my birthday or not. Doesn't make a, make a bit of difference to me, and I like Michael's birthday, Michael uh, Miller's birthday. That's a great. He likes his birthday so much. I enjoy birthdays just because of how much he likes it. Uh, but to be honest with you, day one day is like another. But a feast and Thanksgiving in particular, you know, I enjoy when our church, a lot of a lot of years, we get together on Thanksgiving, don't we? Have a big big get together here, and it's really a lot of fun. And we all give testimonies and praise the Lord. We do a lot of nice food. and You know, we usually have all the different kinds of turkey. Smoked turkey, fried turkey, baked turkey, and all the different pies. And pie is a wonderful thing, no matter the occasion. We have a good time with food. But you know what really is special about Thanksgiving is when we get up and we remember what God's done. And we just think, oh, God has been good to us. And I'm going to tell you something, my friend. Joy and gratitude are something that we need to deliberately schedule in our lives. Just look back and say, look what God's done. Oh, I'm so grateful for it. You know, gratitude will make you joyful. And joy will make you strong. 
It's amazing how many people are literally weak. I'm not diagnosing disorders or anything like that, but there are so many people in depression because they don't have joy. And they don't have joy because they're looking not at what God's done, not at what, who God is. They're not deliberately rejoicing as a believer ought to. They're just looking at what isn't done or what whatever. And now, again, I'm not trying to make a, a medical commentary. Or I realize people go through things, and I am very, very sympathetic to those things. But I'm just telling you something. The secret, <laughs> the secret's joy. And a person who looks at what God's done and gets God's Word and looks at who God is doesn't look at what's missing. They look at what they don't deserve that they have. I get frustrated sometimes with people that just gripe and complain. Because they're not interested in the great things that they have or what God's done. They just whine about what they don't have or what's different than they think it should be. Friend, if things were as they should be, you know what that scenario, where that scenario goes, don't you? If I had what I deserve, God would be my enemy. And so I have every reason to be joyful and be grateful. And so now we see a people who have gone from a place of grief to joy and then Bible says in verse 16 that they became obedient. When the, the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, they said, okay, we're supposed to do this. Let's do it. Let's do it. And oh, what a change in attitude there is from when Nehemiah first came to town. Isn't it? I mean, when he first came to town, things were so bad that he couldn't even ride his, uh, his animal, his beast of burden, around the city because things were so broken down. He had to walk. And now he's come to town and there's a crowd. There's a unified body of people who are saying, tell us what God said. They're grieved when they realize that they're not what God wanted them to be. And then they responded by moving from grief to joy and their joy took them to a stage or a place of obedience. Now I'm going to finish with this tonight, but I want us to see, Christian, but there's a big difference in an attitude between a Christian who is convicted by something and a person who just wants to obey. I don't like sometimes a lot of the a lot of the statements that we make about preaching. Preachers get up, I'm about to step on some toes right now. Well, I'll be honest with you, my friend, I don't really I'm not really concerned about stepping on toes or not stepping on toes. You know what's great when you're preaching? What's great is when you have people that say, I want to know what God says so I can do it. Because I just want to see God. You're not going to step on toes on a person. You're not going to offend a person that says, if God says so, that's me. I'm doing it. I'm all in. I mean, I want to know. Is there anything else? I've, I've met believers. I've been at places in time in my life where I say, God, is there anything? Is there anything you want from me? God, is there anything that I don't know about that I ought to be doing? You know, James says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it's sin. There's believers that say, don't tell me. And they actually avoid hearing because they don't want to know. And they really shouldn't be concerned about it because they're not going to obey anyway. There's a big difference, isn't there, between a people who don't determine whether or not they're going to do something. They just want to determine whether or not God said it, and they're going to do it. They're going to obey. And here's the people that said, well, we've been, we were supposed to make booths all this time. Let's build booths. Let's do it. Let's go camping. By the way, you ever look at the Feast of Booths in the Scripture? You talk about a fun feast. I actually would like to do it sometime. Uh, not the way they do you know, in, in the Jewish areas, because they don't do it the Bible way. Wouldn't it be cool if you just had a remembrance feast like Israel has? That you remember that God gave you the land, gave you the promised land, and you instead of living in your fancy house, you go camping. And you remember where you came from. Because that's what the Feast of Booths was all about. Hey, we lived in tents in the wilderness. We lived in temporary structures that were not sufficient to protect us from the elements or from the enemies. And now here's a group of people that got their walls built around them, and honestly, they've been living in structures, but their structures were no more security to them than the tents. And now things have changed so drastically along with God's people. 
that they're looking forward to celebrating this feast. And as they celebrate this feast, there's a great spirit of obedience. And friend, God's about to do something in Israel that hadn't been done for a very long time. Well, let's pray. God, thank you so much for what you've showed us this evening. Thank you for what we've been able to discern and to learn. Lord, I pray that as a result of what we've seen about this progression, first of deliberately putting ourselves before your word and letting the scripture be what determines what we believe. And then God, reading and teaching your word and understanding it. And then going from grief to joy to obedience. I pray that you would help us to see where we ought to be at. And God, as pastor of this ministry, it would be my heart's greatest desire to have us be in the place of obedience where the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I pray that you take us through the process that we need in order to be there, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, let's take prayer requests tonight, shall we?